Something more goes to compose com- consecration of the fine murder, with two blockheads to kill and to be killed, a knife, a purse, a dark line. Thomas D. Quincy, a dead man is the best full guy in the world. He never talks back. Raylan and Chanda. In the end, I will forgive you. I'm sorry to have stayed that, say that, but I will forget myself too, so don't feel bad. Stephen J. Bernstein Part 1. First rule, never open your story with a corpse. It's a cliché, most important, more important. I don't like it, so don't do it. If you're going to be, do it, be ironic. Throw your manuscript in your face. If you do it to piss me off, I'll flunk you. And then you can explain to your parents, who pay your fucking tuition, how you wrecked your grade point average with a lame ass workshop in crime fiction. Lee Todd Butcher, R.I.P. Chapter 1 On a Friday afternoon at the end of a shitty week, I was waiting for a bus in the merciless rain for a quarter of an hour and giving up trudging the final six blocks and stomping up three flights of steps up my, to my lousy, cramped apartment in a building reeking with mouse turds and tomato soup. Last thing I expected to find waiting for me was a dead body, face down on the living room floor, sprawled across the cruddy tangerine carpet that came with the place. By the way, I'm using the term face down loosely. Corpse lay taut at the sharp end, one arm extended towards the window, the other pinned me for the torso. Most of the face had travelled across the room, and now decorated the mantel, a fireplace in fading streaks. A fine plume of brain matter curled out of the demolished forehead with a comical flourish. A revolver rested quietly as if ashamed under the coffee table. Given the circumstances, some people might scream, other people would cry. Here's what I did. I stepped over the body and made for the pack of American spirits on the mantel. Cause fuck moderation at a time like that. I needed a cigarette, three cigarettes, a glass of burgundy, four tokes of breed. About half an hour, about an hour later, I had time to calm down and think. Most of my thoughts took the form of questions. First, if not, it's not the most alarming. Why was there no response to a gunshot inside my Capitol Hill apartment? Had novelty of it confused my neighbours. Druida, did you hear that loud bang? Did you say bang to me? I'm not kidding. Did you hear it? A bang, an actual, like a noise. Judica. Please, noise, I like a bang. I have no idea. Listen, I taped last week's X-Files. Do you want to watch it before the new episode, or do you want to investigate a so-called bang? I can't have them both right now. Second, and still not the worst part, is at that time, did it happen? It was a work all day. How long did the corpse lie there on the carpet? I tried to remember precisely when I left the apartment. It was morning, yes, before dawn, thanks to my soul-sucking job at the photo coffee centre. I recognised the acid coffee grounds, mouldering in a French press on a black and white kitchen counter. From the carpet came the scent of dried blood, a bitter tang of rust. Also lingering the gag-worthy trance, I realised, recognised from the saloon around the corner, burnt hair like sweet tusky caramel. Sat on the floor and stared at my corpse. I wondered how long I'd been dead. This was the worst part. Not the first or second thing that occurred to me, but in most upsetting sequences. I smoked and drank and considered what to do next. I wandered round my squatted living room. I leaned against the window in view of an ATM alcove across the street, a place where people sweat and ate and peed and offered outrageous services for a dollar. Where I at once observed a schizophrenic homeless man, mighty a drunk seafarer pirate, with a samurai sword. I gazed down the ATM when it hit me, the craving, the incessant surge, the fine the crowded room, the crisp white linen, seeming cups of coffee, warm bodies, and the buzz of conservation, conversation, to menace myself in all those human sounds and delicate motions. I don't want any sign a taste of things to come. Almost as soon as I left the film looking for coffee, I was starting through the window, a B&Q espresso. I was staring 
through the window at B and Q espresso. The dying pour subsided in a drizzle. I saw a table inside the cab. Standing in the view, your maid scat you were scanning the traffic, sluicing up the down olive way. Your eyes reflected the rain on glass. You sighed, fascinated by the by drifting clouds. I watched you lift a cup of espresso to your lips. I wondered what the hell you were thinking. And then I knew you congratulated yourself, being patient and set, staying put. You were waiting. Yes, that was that this was a test. You're plotting against your lover, a married with two children, tax attorney, described to by girlfriends as your polymer. A really twisted tale is re- always a love story, isn't it? Tears before cocktails, quick screwing up a downtown hotel every other Friday. Tax only wanted to break up with you, but he was afraid. He was taking the coward's route, putting all of the, uh, all your flaws and hoping to m- make you leave him. But that you were tender, tender, tenderous. Some would have called you a stalker, though tenacious. Some of you, some would call you Tsuka, though you might. Thought of your life is more heroic terms. You are baby ignoring your lover's criticism, or your patience of scattered nature, and your shadow opinions. You wanted to kill him, because you didn't love him, love, love you, more than, than you wanted him dead. You wanted to hurt him, you wanted to break him, you wanted to twist the necks, his preschool children, till they snapped in your hands. Well, well. I turned my face left and right, no friction, captured your, your attention. A rain splattered window between us, the pattern folded. The beat refolded, the lace fell of rain and darkness. Designs kept opening the further and further seemed beyond reach. All the way down to the crooked spine of Denny Way, beyond bumbling traffic and breathless pedestrians, the aftermath of the storm. Binding its time south, churned up and tried against a battery, splittered piers, diners scattered across plates of fried clams, bowls of salmon, chowder beyond steam restaurant, windows at the market. I felt the breeze like a cold blade across my back, a late with afternoon ferry, lights glowing from the gar, but the decks glided across a little bay, a slender point separation between water and sky. I knew this without looking. Just as I knew a girl with a pasty dress had put a pool of Stanley knife on a driver of, of a, a, a seven bus a mount downtown mountain a metro line, it took me screeched to a halt. Being curious breast turned out to be a chock full of mistresses that Friday. I allowed my attention to wander out to another table. At first glance I knew the man you were waiting to see wasn't going to show up. He was a co-worker in a seedy room in the Ever Spring Inn, six miles north of Ever- Odora Avenue. The co-worker was laughing, blinded by thick strands of champagne, blonde hair across her face, a whiff of jasmine rising from her abdomen each time he thrust himself. He thrust inside her. her. He studied your smile. I saw you too wound up. Too desperate to you to be happy. You were impatient with others. You saw yourself as a significant person, another person of scenery. Your impulse was always to move, to exit, to leave the door squeaking on its hinges. In a couple of years, purely seeking attention, the most dramatic way, you eat the fistful valium, the resulting fog which could surround you, hold you as tightly as its winter coat, and you would step into railway tracks to greet the train from Portland. A blistering cold night, my sister would drive to the mall. The event side, the pieces retrieved at the scene. That's where I left you. My brief second encounter, a bubbling, a slightly chubby, Anna Karina sipping coffee and greedy like a million other lonely fools. Convince you right to spend your life this way in a melodramatic haze, self absorbed to know, too self absorbed to know you were doomed. Since that night, I have felt a constant urge to itch to tell my story. I wanted to fill my words, forming my tongue and flowing from my fingertips. I wanted the whole day, the whole year before it, my entire existence to be a story. I can use because that's how desperate people are, and they're all calculating. Even dead people, we want our lives to add up to something, despite all the evidence to the contrary. When the police eventually responded to my landlord's call, they broke down my door to pinpoint. A new terrible smell perpetrating the building. It would have been nice if someone somewhere 
known a couple things about me. Things that would never read in a newspaper. For example, never part of the publishing screen. Whatever the hell that might be. Any scene going on in Seattle, trust me, I wasn't part of it. Is anything cool or great that was happening while I was alive? I'm not involved in any way. It seemed by past me like a rock in the middle of the freeway. One thing both definitely has got wrong with my taste in music. I'm not as club hopping vibe but local. I don't even I'm not even an usual Nevada fan. If I was I never was. I'd say I was more of a guff hunter. Pixie cramps, Velvet Underground, Robert Johnson on a Sunday and occasional break but I'll Surfers, Gail. So the implications that I would copycat Gowen's suicide pissed me off more than anything. Almost everything, anything. As the time went on, as time goes on, facts mean less than the relief. I feel on these occasions when I cross paths with a soulmate, because bitterness turns out is eternal. It gathers in momentum, feed on it occasionally, sacrifice it doesn't subside. It feels better. People. Do, it feels a bit better, deeper, more electrifying. Oh, of course, I hated my life for my fate because I tell a stretch of 1994, 20 something, with a terrible job, living in a grubby apartment in the city, best known as suicide rate, and silver home colours. This was not too much. The trouble was, despite my newfound ability to read bits of information on random strangers, I couldn't remember exactly what happened in my own apartment. On that first day, oh, oh, after a while, the blast, its explosion, light and darkness returned. But not the face staring at me from behind the barrel, the face of my stupid enemy, remained a mystery for some time. The first time I only knew my memory was becoming selective, a tiny door was etched into an immense wall, running as far as I could see. I couldn't possibly, couldn't, was a possible observe I wanted when I want, wanted. For, but once I opened the door, the random view was spectacular, none of which mattered to the cops when they started kicking the door to my apartment. They had to go by and went, what, what they could see. The first thing they saw was my corpse. The second was a gun I never owned. The fingerprint on me. The third was a notebook lying down on the floor at the coffee table. The fourth thing was his journal entry written two days prior. Have you ever hated someone? Not the parking space, quite stealing kind of hate. Not the ex-lover and his closet-wearing, skinny new boyfriend kind of hate. I'm talking about being bold, being surging, your spellings, taste of sulfur in the back of your throat, objects, t- only objects becoming alluring. You seduce your imagination, steak knife, pizzazz in your hand, observe a fate paralysed by a desire to find us, your purpose in your companion's heart, the throes of hatred. You might forget to bathe, you might start, your day with a face that feels like a living, livid, lined with wet sand because you forgot to sleep. 2 a.m. you start talking back to the clock on the nightstand. You bitch the right clock right out. You bitch that clock right out. For <coughs> half an hour you address the clock by the name of your nemesis. Brilliant to the cops and the newspapers. I would be nothing but a nutcase. Another terrible girl who couldn't handle life in the city. When people glance at the brief perfectly items in the d- dallies, they would learn that uh, I have an un- unpublished writer, a twenty-something deadbeat, a liar and a pag- 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 That Friday in November 1994, I became everything my former boss, Eve w- w- Weiss, said I was. I don't know if my downward spiral starting with my job as a coming weekly paper, or stealing another writer's story, or leaving, losing contests, or moving to the city, or having sex with my writing teacher, or being born in the dullest suburb in the northwest. On one level, I realised it wasn't beginning with Eve. I only associate her with my failure. All the ugliness I stone really came alive once I knew her name and accepted the job she offered me. Was, who was this person? This fulcrum of my bitter disappointments. She was nothing. Eve Wallace was the kind of woman. The Todd Butcher wouldn't have noticed if she'd gone up, were alone to give in a bathtub. She was of effort of a middle aged woman. Same new vessel as ship holding it into a port for the last time. She enjoyed nothing. Her life was over. 
when she first met, she was in her late uh, mid thirties. I count the late thirties according to the gossip on the forties. Guess by appearances, she was close to being visible, impossible for a living person to be. As she sat in the cafe when she went back to the complicated waterfall pattern, water pa- all paper pattern. I sat opposite her. A moment would eventually arrive, and my vision couldn't separate Eve from the new wallpaper. Eve and I not alike in any way. Lee Todd once told me I was a killer by nature. Pragmatic sages. Bun a wound of salt in the wound. It is if this description was accurate if this description was accurate, several things would make sense. But why I would take the word of a loser, a quaint ass poet, a hat, Raymond Chandler, who ran out of time. Lee Todd warned me not to settle to move to Seattle. I told him to go to go to hell. It's funny how things turned out. Who knows, maybe in another light month or two, I would have made my mind to leave the city. Maybe I would have dropped, stopped obsessing of Lee, over Lee, um, uh, Todd's fucked up advice. Both taken and rejected. Maybe I, uh, I would have been ready to find out what, who I was, I wanted to do. I might have travelled, maybe to India, even maybe <laughs> Europe. Well, never mind. As they say, apparently I've been rotting in my old cold mist in the mildew, wherever passes from, for eternity these days. I stranded in rain, the port city crowned round of bay wind stagnations. For centuries, everybody's wanted a piece of this place. I can't figure out why. Crows on the land, seagulls on the water, and grey people scuttle back and forth under low skies, clutching paper cups of coffee, ducking rainbows, ducking raindrops, and bird shit. Below the surface, tantalic plates grind one another's edges, bulging, compressing, threatening to break open the drag and landscape under. No matter what's left under the tsunami roll in the ocean, pulls together natural man made into a rolling ground of dirt, rock, and foam. I'd probably still be here, perched on a rock, reclining on a limb of an ancient redwood. I'm sipping this fresher, waiting for the next thing to happen. It's how I bide my time by following strangers and making friends. A series of carpeted gothic houses on 23rd Avenue huddle in shadows like a roll with silent monks on a sun and summer night. Too humid for comfort, too hot late for a walk, a night for keeping the window ajar. You must be a new cutter. I see the Scottish little scars on the inside of your arms. Fading or evening is adolescence. Yours is a surname, Seattle founding father. So embarrassed by the fact that you do, by a less capricious moniker, I tell yourself, and tell yourself you being humble and real, hiding under the, uh, your grandmother's maiden name, living in central district, waving to the neighbours who guard you with a very shake of the head and shrug. You're the white, weird white lady in the house on the corner, the messy yard. No one lo- likes you. You grew up in Pacific Northwest, attended a sports school, a college for Sidminster, and an Evergreen State College, an ever- artistic haven called your daddy hatred. It's all make up as you go along and give yourself a, an eye for marketry education, he said, and wanted you to be sensible. Truthful caretaker, family a, a, a legacy, at last. You wanted to be a trexel weaver or folk music, musician. You lost interest as soon as your mother brought you a loom guitar. Your d- childhood drifted from dock in a gloomy silence as you wandered in the pack, fog from the port to port of the pungent sound on your stepdaddy's yacht. Your parents and your fussy silver Head friends all full of rules and pretensions. Your ice cold houses teem with hideous heirlooms. You never let your talk about your real anything real. They smirk and chuckle when you rant about human rights, animal rights, the planet and space travel. They live in quaint piles of Victorian perched on the crumbling edges of Mercer Island. A porter from the post intelligence. Once profiled your stepdad of the weekend edition and described your home as picturesque. After you read the article, you hid under the red all day and slept 
felt angry because no one came looking for you. The only child with a fund, trust fund, and no need to set reality at 35, you still believe in spirits, wood sprites, and fuzzy, said, druid. All imaginary friends are welcome in your world. You burn the sorest white candles to ward off negative energy. You cried for two days over the blood of heroin crushed by a friend's motorboat. A heartbroken, overgrown girl with no boundaries. You're crying about how heroin. Again, even when I find you sitting cross-legged on the floor of your living room, the floorboards gleam because of me, comes to clean and polish them bi-monthly. Your square fingernails are poised on a placet on the Ouija board, scanning the arc for of letters, souls at will, feel free to come and settle here, you whisper to the gloom, settle here beside me, mysterious smoky clouds roam, the night skies set as low as the rooftops, fizzle through your windows, you imagine ghostly spirits riding in the clouds to your doorstep, you long to be connected with the entity, someone, anyone, a sign of living cosmos beyond, you inspire friends and trust funds, yachts and potholes, Anything real you believe, you'll make you real too. A bolt of truth from the heavens will be rendered to endless comforts, illicit dreams of your dowdy life. Somehow, different. this is what you want. You tell yourself, you tell me. I wonder your way. I consider your weight the way the flesh of your feet strains on the leather straps of your sandals. You spent years in therapy, more years being regimented and counseled by bodywork professionals. To no avail. You can't find happiness as you are. You can't alert other your physique, not as your parents wanted you to do it. Your infinite delicacy and patience, I slide my hands over yours. I note the winding of your eyes, the quickening of your pulse. Allow the rough contours of your stubby child on the fingers. It's all mine. I began to squeak the pendant panachet of a pattern forming my name. And greeting Greta, we write, Hello, your hands slip from mine. You scream, you snatch a panelette from the board and fling it across the room to scatter across the window ledge. You keep on screaming despite my efforts of calming you, and then your crab walk clumsily over the polished floor to the corner, still screaming siren like. You clasp your knees to the chest, the contortion of your pain, your pain and face, sad face, tells me that your next excuse for me, well, this will be your next excuse for medication. Also, a month long stay at your uncle's farm, Furthermouth Island. The housekeeper will feed your creamery delicacies three times a week. You will give away your books on the cult and take up Justin Jane Austen. You will finally obey your mother and marry a stockbroker. Give an excuse, creating painfully birth to a child you don't love, you can't love, and spend your days planning dinner parties and boating trips. And the very night you will swallow a tiny pill for seven blissful hours. The dream is sleep, until the night when you finally feed your soul by bottling all the pills and watching them down with a bottle of burglar's back, all to forget me.